trail and ultra runners what is going on what's happening welcome to another episode of the coop cast as always i'm your humble host coach jason coop and on this episode of the podcast we are going to do something that i have never done before and i've never done this before very intentionally we are going to talk about my training in the lead up to the hard rock 100 and I have to give a little bit of a background before we actually get into our conversation today. One of the reasons, in fact, the primary reason that I've been so hesitant to do this, and I know there's a lot of audience members out there asking, were asking me to do this after Coca-Dona, but the reason that I'm very hesitant to do this is that I understand that I'm a coach first and not an athlete, and what I do for my training may not be translatable to the audience out there. And the last thing I would want would, would be to, to, for somebody to copy and paste what I have actually done for my training onto them. However, this is a really unique situation because also in this year's edition of the Hard Rock 100, one of our fellow coaches and one of our crack coaches, John Fitzgerald, was also in the race. And he and I just happened to undertake two diametrically opposed training philosophies going into the race. And I do not say that lightly because as you will find out throughout the course of this conversation, at almost every turn from how we handled our volume to strength training to cross training, our nutrition strategies, almost the entire run of show, there were vast discrepancies and more importantly, there were very specific and discreet reasons for those discrepancies. And I think that they turned out very well because John and I both had great races out at the Hard Rock 100. So on the podcast today, I'm bringing on my fellow coach, John Fitzgerald, and we are going to discuss it. We're going to shoot the stuff and talk about our own training and we're going to challenge each other on the on that training process at various points during this conversation, all in a better way to understand how you can take some of these fundamental principles that we deployed and utilize them for your training. I had a hoot with this. This was really fun. I did not realize how much differently John and I trained for this particular race until we actually got into the weeds of it. I hope you all have a lot of fun listening to this conversation as well. But most importantly, I hope that you take away all of the fundamental nuggets of wisdom that we are trying to pass on that we learn through ourselves in training for this extremely arduous event. So with that as a backdrop, I'm getting right out of the way. Here's my conversation with coach John Fitzgerald about our individual training processes for the Hard Rock 100. Dude, so it's fresh on your mind, right? You just got back to Montana. <laughs> Pretty fresh, still kind of processing the whole, the whole ordeal, but... Yeah, it was definitely quite the experience. It's a, big, the it's a big race, right? I mean, it's like the whole course is no joke. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a big race. I mean, it's not a, there are not a lot of runners. What's the cap? 160? Yeah, 145, yeah. 145, yeah. Yeah, so it, it kind of feels like a small event when you're actually out there. But, you know, considering how long it takes people to get in, it took me, took me 10 years. I thought it was 11. It was actually 10, 10 years to get in. So it's kind of a long time. So here, here's the like first piece of irony. So what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about both of our experiences training for, and then running the hard rock 100. And we're going to try to relate those experiences into takeaways that any athlete can, um, can, uh, can, can put towards their training and their racing. But kind of the first point of irony is you first put in for this race, it's 2012 and I can do simple math or 2022. <laughs> so I can do simple math. So if you put in 10 years ago, it was 2012. That was the last year that I finished the race. So, oh, wow. yeah, so there's the first point of irony. I've got two hard rock posters on my uh, on my wall, framed up on uh, my wall. One from 2010, which is the first year I finished the race, and the second one from 2012, second year I finished the race. Obviously, they're both in the same same direction. But that's when you first started putting in. And I remember when I first got in in 2010, 2010 I'd been on the, I'd been applying for four years. Four. And I thought that that was just an astronomical wait to have to wait for four years to get into, to, to get into a race. And, and it was at the time, you know, 2010, you know, it's not kind of the 
the hype isn't around it as much as it is right now. But for for you to wait 10 years to get in, it's kind of be almost becoming more the norm. Like it's still an astronomical amount of time. It's a whole freaking yeah. decade, right? You're a completely different person, a different man, a different husband, a different, you know, just professional, like all across the board. Yeah. So to wait to wait that long and have it be the norm is just the kind of the first point of everything, right? <laughs> It's kind of crazy. It was a small story to this. And I don't know, maybe I've mentioned this before. I know a lot of my athletes know this, but actually technically it took me five years to get in. So I did get the name called year five. Um, I ended up uh, going to a close cousin's wedding um, instead of the race, which I get a lot of crap for. <laughs> but um, my, my close cousin, Joey, back in New Hampshire, he, he called me up uh, and it was like, he, he really wanted me to be in his wedding. And so I just, I knew I couldn't, go to hard rock and know that yeah i was missing out on my close cousin's wedding so <laughs> mentally i figured that would be tough but uh yeah they, they had since divorced so oh, <laughs> they were together for maybe about a year close to a year <laughs> so so that, so there is a little bit of so it's technically five but i thought that that was my chance right five years and yeah, then I, yeah. didn't, I didn't accept it so then i was like okay i'll never get in so six years later no five years later um i get my name pulled again so yeah. Wow. Well, good for you. Well, you're you're a better cousin than I am a brother because my younger brother's uh, 40th birthday, which is a big birthday, uh, was the Hard Rock Weekend. And sure. This this Hard Rock Weekend. And I told him, I'm like, Jonathan, the, my, my younger brother's name's Jonathan. Uh, like, Jonathan, I'm not coming to your birthday. I will celebrate with you at another point in time. <laughs> I miss you, bro. I love you. But you'll you get it. Unfortunately, he's yeah. You know, he's he he was a collegiate athlete as well, so he kind of knows okay. how important these things are. So yeah, anyway, yeah. maybe that just makes you a better a better a better friend and family member than than I do. But needless to say, it's it's kind of like hard to get in the race, and um, I think this kind of brings us to our like our first circle around point, right? The fact that you waited a long time, I I waited a long time. It's been, like I said, it had been nearly a decade since mm -hmm. I'd finished the race last from 2012 being my last finish to 2022 now kind of being being in the race and not that i was in the lottery every single year that's just the way it kind of worked out right um but many other athletes kind of go through that experience of where they're just kind of like waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and finally all of a sudden they get you know the call whether they make it in the lottery or kind of come off of the come off of the wait list and then they usually have this like proverbial moment moment of oh my god what did i get myself into because it is a really big race and they do normally only get, you know, kind of one shot at their first one because right. of that waiting game. And that kind of weighs on people. And I, and I kind of want to know from you, like, since you had already been through the process before and you thought that you like missed your shot, like, what did you think about, you know, getting in the second time or getting in the second time around? Cause you got in off of the lottery itself, right? You, you didn't get yeah. called up off the wait list. You knew that you were in it once they pulled all right. the names out of the hat. Totally. Yeah. It, I, I think part of it was just like, just the allure and the excitement. I think when you wait that long, it just, you know, when you do get your name pulled it, you know, it's, it's exciting, right? It's like, you know, and especially with having that chance, I was like, Hmm, shoot. You know, I, I think the odds are against me of getting in. I had my chance, but I don't know. Let's just see what happens, you know? And uh, yeah, I, I typically would do a hundred, 100 mile race each year it happened to be the bear, which is how I qualified there. And so I was like, you know, I'll just keep throwing the name in the hat and see what happens. So, but uh, yeah, I just tell athletes that whether it's Western States or hard rock or trying to think of any other big lottery uh, races, but you know, if you're really curious and interested in the event, just, just keep at it, you know? And I think there's, <laughs> there's, you're going to get that, that jolt of uh, excitement and that's going to really help you out. I think on the day quite a bit. Well, and you had even more motivation than you're kind of leading on to, because I feel like the, and I didn't, I didn't quite put this all together until I saw you and your wife, Hannah, right before the, right before the race where the timing is very serendipitous for you, right? Because you've been waiting for so long and your wife is now I'm trying to do the I'm trying to do the math in my head. Six months pregnant, is that right? Twenty-four weeks. So 
Yeah, that's about yeah. right. Yeah. So she's doing no she was doing November. Early, right. Do early November, yeah. So this is I mean, it's not like your last hurrah or whatever, but needless to say, it would be a little bit more complicated if you were to have gotten in the year after and the year after that. But also it kind of puts you in a really cool position where she can actually be out at the race for you. Cause I know she's a big part of your whole like support, your whole support crew to where she can still participate in a way that's material to you and like be out there and be, and be a part of the whole ordeal. Yeah, no, I a hundred percent. I think the time it was, was spot on. I think also the energy I got, you know, from that too. And <laughs> I had a few athletes that have, that have kids and they were just like, yeah, you're going to have this like, you know, uh, superhuman strength out there and, uh, you know, knowing that you're going to be a father and they're going to be having a, a baby boy in November and, and yeah, a hundred percent that was, you know, motivating for sure to see, <laughs> to see my wife out there. I was out, I was out in Silverton a couple weeks ahead of the race as well. So it was actually, I think a little bit even more special to, you know, see Hannah, the, the baby growing a little bit and all this, you know, a couple weeks, he, you'd be amazed, but, uh, yeah, so definitely good timing and, um, yeah, just really was excited to just, yeah, I don't know. I just had this, this energy in me, but ahead of the race that was, had never felt it before. And whether it was the expecting a child in the fall, or I just got in a hard rock, I don't know what it was, but it was just like, it was a really weird feeling. I've never felt. Yeah. Well, it kind of, I don't know. It kind of puts the emphasis on making sure everything goes right. Right. Because you have this, you have this race where it's extremely hard to get into from the get go. It's ridiculously arduous when you're in the thick of it. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, like just how hard all the miles are to, uh, uh, to kind of come by. And it's hard for everybody. I mean, even the best of, you know, athletes out there, I was listening to an interview with uh, Francois who was, you know, who, who was second in the race. And he was lamenting about, you know, he was nauseous and throwing up and, you know, had all these kind of episodes and things like that. And we tend to put these elite athletes on this pedestal where they, you know, they, they don't have any issues, but they suffer, you know, some of the same ailments. And in fact, most of the same ailments that everybody else suffers, they're just going a lot faster when they, uh, when they do it. But you had, you know, this added, this added kind of like this added kind of fact where, like I said, the timing was just really, was just really serendipitous. And I, I don't know if you kind of like felt that in your prep where you're just like, Hey, I got to make sure that I get all this right or not. So I, did that go into your like calculus at all or anything? Yeah. Was, there was almost less pressure. Like, huh. I don't know if there was any pre yeah. Yeah, expectation or pressure, even though there might've, have, might've have been a little bit, but, or maybe other people perceive that there might be because I'm, you know, expected father things like this. But I think knowing that, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to be a father, uh, you know, I had my, you know, I had my brother out from Massachusetts and, and that's really what got me going. I, I typically keep hundred milers pretty simple with just like one or two friends, you know, Hannah and maybe a friend at the race, but with hard rock, I really wanted to kind of create this experience, not just for myself, but other people. And that was, that was kind of a new approach for me. And, so that really kind of fueled me. It was like just seeing my brother come from Boston, just like jumping off the trees and the rocks, just like with excitement. <laughs> and knowing that they were out there enjoying themselves was what kind of kept me pretty relaxed and just like, yeah, I'm just out here, you know, just having having fun. So yeah. So less pressure than than I thought there would be. But huh. yeah. that's cool. L let's talk about training a little bit and then we'll get into the the, the race itself. And I want to, like I said, like I said, from the onset, I want to use this as a little bit of here's what everybody can learn from our individual training processes, which, um, I imagine are going to be quite different just kind of knowing each yeah. of our ramp ups into, into things, although we're very similar, you know, runners at the end of the day with similar levels of experience and, uh, and, and, and talent, so to speak. But we had two different, two two very different paths that I think a lot of people can um, uh, can can learn from. So, can you once you got drawn from the lottery, can you try to like encapsulate how you um, how how you approached the training process and then what you went through in those next several months, and then I'll try to parallel that just to draw a little bit of the of of, of the contrast of what we yeah. were both going through. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So obviously super, super stoked and excited to get in, uh, in the winter time here in Montana. So obviously it's winter, Montana, really uh, winter. You have real winters by the way. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> negative 25 for weeks, a couple weeks, at least every winter. Uh, but yeah, since moving back to Montana from Colorado in 2017, I kind of got back into winter sports. I'd kind of stepped away, not stepped away, but I just lived in areas where it's just more, it was easier to just get out and run throughout the year. Um, so yeah, big preparation for me kind of started or continued it when I found out I got in with just continuing to, to Nordic ski. Um, there was this temptation and maybe this kind of draw to maybe start running a little bit more sooner, but I, I just have really enjoyed em embracing the winter in Montana and just another sport. Um, I've learned just a ton about myself, but also just like enjoy it. Like, I think that's the key with me and, and Nordic skiing. So I, I ended up skiing quite a bit. I think the most I've ever skied this winter. Um, I did quite a bit of racing as well. Uh, I did a couple 50 kilometer races on the skis and then I ended up going up to Canada for some ski racing as well. But the idea with the ski racing was I knew hard rock was going to be event that, um, I was going to be using poles. Um, so I, I wanted to, just have as much experience with poles as possible. And I knew that being so far out from the event that I could leverage cross country skiing to just develop a really big engine and get really fit. And I knew that I didn't really need to be, I don't know, I call it beating my head against the wall, just putting in tons of volume at that time. So the other thing I wanted to make sure I did for hard rock was there's again, this temptation to want to do more running and more just training yeah. in general, yeah. but with it being a high altitude race, I definitely wanted to make sure that I was going into hard rock fresh and not fatigued at all. Uh, I, I, Coop, you and I, we did the no ones right. I think it was two years ago. Yeah. 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 And just kind of reflecting on that experience. I think one takeaway that I had, well, there's a couple, but one of which is I went down there, not acclimated. The other one was I went down there with a bit of fatigue in the body. Uh, the third one was just a, an, a, a type of an effort that I, that I put out, I think in the beginning, uh, that was just a little bit too quick for me. So all those combined, I think led to not feeling super great pretty quick. Uh, so I, I, I took that experience down on the Nolan's route and I was like, you know what, I need to make sure that I get really fit far out, but I need to make sure that I, I go into hard rock well rested. Mm -hmm. And so I guess going back to winter, so I developed the engine, I got super fit, uh, skiing, uh, I took typically come off skiing, like yeah, just really fit. Like a lot of the routes I'll do here in Helena running, I'm typically running uphill, uh, the fastest when I come off of ski season and the way that I, I approach the ski season is that I'm not just skiing. So I ski probably about five to six days a week, but I still maintain a pretty consistent, uh, workload of running. So I'm typically running between 20 and 50 K a week. So the reason for that is well, I have two very high active dogs that need to get out every day. But <laughs> the other one is I find that uh, just keeping the connective tissue engaged, keeping the bio biomechanics there um, and just the feel for running so that the transition from ski skiing to more running is easier. Um, I've done it the other way where I've actually really reduced my running workload and I've skied, just skied. And I find that there's a longer transition period. So I, I introduced uh, just that foundation base of 20 to 30 miles every week throughout the winter, just to keep that, that base of running there. So I found that as I started to transition as the snow melted, as I started to run more, um, I had the well-developed engine that it was just a matter of keeping my patient hat on and just gradually building my run volume. And, uh, at that point, really, I didn't start building my running until like mid-March. So mm -hmm. that was the interesting thing. Cause I actually get a lot of comments from, uh, folks and the, uh, coaches, athletes that I coach, like I got a lot of comments, like, Hey, when are you going to start running? When are you going to start training for hard rock? <laughs> and it was funny. Cause that brought me back to actually, when I got into Western States and I got a lot of that from coworkers. I got a lot of that from athletes that I coach. And, you know, part of me was just like, I am training. Like, you know, this is You're still my training, run. right? It's just not specific. Yeah. So they're just like, Oh my God, like he's not running that much, but I'm still putting in quite a bit of workload and, and, yeah. and how I feel based off different, you know, routes that I have in town or what have you, I trusted my body 
you know, and I trusted that through that approach of, of, of using another modality like skiing that I was keeping freshness and I was keeping the excitement for running there. So that as I got into running, it was like, I call it like a kid, you know, it's just, I had this bottled up energy that yeah. I have a harder time tapping into when I'm just running more frequently. So, so I was in a good spot with that. So a good base of skiing transitioned into running, started to kind of get the long run up a little bit. Um, uh, so that was kind of like, I had, yeah, started to build the frequency and then obviously the, uh, the long run duration, the tricky part for me in Montana is that the, the snowpack kind of held on for quite a while up high. So really yeah. it was harder for me to get up in, in, in the mountains in Montana without putting on snowshoes or skis, uh, backcountry skis. I don't do a ton of backcountry skiing. Um, so I kind of utilize my trails here in Helena, which we have a, a great network right from the door but it's a lot of this like 1200 to 1500 foot climb kind of deal. It's nothing that's like, like, like what, what you have coop, like 3000 foot sustained, 4,000 foot or more yeah. <laughs> sustained climb. So I had to be creative with that. Um, so I, I just made the best of what I had out the door and started to increase my vertical. The other thing that I do, that's also a little bit different, I guess, maybe than other runners might take is I, I also utilize the bike in my training quite a bit. Um, my, I come from more of a multi-sport background. I raced triathlons in college. I also raced cycle cross and mountain bikes. And so I have this history of, uh, I don't know if you want to call it cross training, but biking. And, and so I find that uh, I can leverage the bike as a tool in my training. It definitely does not replace my running, but I find that I can use it to increase my overall workload within a week. And for me, I like to use the bike to uh, specifically get out and do quite a bit of, of climbing. Uh, I find that, then again, there's, there's not like a lot of research on this, which is interesting, but how I, how I feel when I increase the climbing on my bike compared to just going out and doing a flat valley bike ride, I find that that type of fitness transfers to my hiking. So then when I would go hike, I would notice, huh, like I don't feel like I'm losing anything. I feel, if anything, a bit stronger and yeah, I really enjoy this. So I, I kind of kept the bike, uh, pretty consistent. Again, it never replaced a run specifically, but I used it mm -hmm. to keep my overall volume up. I also used it as a way to keep the density of volume there. So instead of doing, uh, back-to-back -back long runs, I would intentionally get out for like an eight to 10 hour bike ride with quite a bit of climbing. And then the following day I would get out for my long run where in hit in past I've done two back-to-back -back long runs, say five to six hours, five to six hours. But I find that the cost of that type of effort running back to back led me to like, I wasn't really feeling up for any type of intensity or volume until like, say even Tuesday or Wednesday, the following week. But when I would do the bike run, the cost was less. So I would, I would feel pretty good come Tuesday or Monday, Tuesday. Um, so I, I, I continued to keep that in the mix uh, pretty consistently up until I left to, to go to Colorado to acclimate. So, so yeah, it was this kind of big uh, foundation of skiing in the winter, slowly transitioning to, to more frequency and increasing my running volume, still leveraging the bike as a tool to keep freshness, but also to keep the, the fit the overall just engine and fitness there. As I gradually got closer to the race, I started to get into more, more vertical it was kind of the, the, the gist of my training. Did you do any intensity with any of those modalities at any point in time? Yeah. So with Nordic skiing is probably the, the highest intensity that I'll do at all ever. <laughs> so yeah. I, I did 50 kilometer races. So I look at that from a percentage of my threshold. Uh, I'm working pretty freaking pretty, pretty high. Uh, not obviously not hundred percent, but it's similar to like bike racing where on a, a lot of the climbs ski skiing, you're going to be at pretty much your lactate threshold, if not over, yeah. and then you recover on the downhill. So, uh, the, the ski season was pretty much like, if you were to relate that to running, that was like a VO two max or, or lactate threshold kind of focus period. Um, I would also do intervals, uh, running. So as I transitioned to running, I did do a uh, 30 kilometer race here in Helena. Uh, so that was a, don't fence me. And they actually used to be part of the La Sportiva cup. It's a fun race in the backyard that ended up being another threshold type effort. So that was in May. So I was still doing quite a bit of intensity, December, January, January, February, March, 
I did the ski races up in Canmore, Canada, which is a ton of intensity, 10 K 30 K 45 yeah. kilometer. So I, I ended up doing a lot of intensity up th really through May. And then after the don't fence me in, uh, for second week of May is when I really pivoted to more high end aerobic work, lots of strength, uh, endurance work. I really didn't do a whole lot of intensity after May 9th. What were your maximums? Like your weekly maximum or your single session maximums? Yeah. Yeah. The other, that's the other one I get with the cross train because I, I, the, the overall running volume is never that high. And I would get, and that's where I would get people like, when are you going to start running? When are you going to start training for hard rock? Cause they might, they would see a, a 50 mile week, right? They would see a, uh, you know, a, 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 a 60 mile running week. I'm just talking about mileage, you know, hours might be a little bit different, but I would say in, in general, the average or my range is between 50 and 70. It's like my sweet spot for running mileage. What does that equate to for hours though? Yeah. I mean, for hours, that's going to be between eight and say 12 hours. Okay. So not a lot, but I might also do eight to 12 hours of biking. So um, I can tolerate a, a pretty high overall workload. It just doesn't come in the way of just running. So if you look at, and my, my training is open on Strava, but if you follow my training on Strava, I was pretty consistent and frequent with about 18 to 22 hours a week in the like two and a half to three months out from hard rock. What's the limiting factor though? And you're not adding more running. Do you just not like to do it or you just feel like you break down or what? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a bigger runner. I'm about 165, 170 pounds. I find when I get my workload over 80 frequently, consistently week after week that I just feel run down. So going back to going into hard rock, fresh, mentally fresh, I knew that I'm very much so capable of running more hours but it comes with a cost and I didn't want that cost to take away from that excitement and that energy that I wanted to give forth on the day. So I kept my running it intentionally at a workload that I knew was like super sustainable, but I made sure that the bulk of that workload came in the way of very specific type of work. So it came in the way of a single session that might be, yeah, more hiking, more vertical focus, using the poles, that kind of thing. And then the cross training was more to just develop the engine. And, uh, I was confident that with that, say 50 to 70 miles, that range, I'm just saying mileage again, to keep it simple, that I was confident that I could keep my connective tissue and I could stay healthy and just how I felt with my long runs and, and just the overall training. I felt very confident that, yeah, I could, I could do more and it was just in a good space. It was, and hard rock was kind of the focus the whole time, right? I mean, you found out that you got in and you didn't have, or at least I don't think you had yeah. any kind of entered like anything in between February and then when was the lottery December and then December. Yeah. Yeah. December. And then. yeah. So I didn't, you know, I didn't have any other, uh, I had a don't fence man 30 K again, which was yeah. yeah 30 K. And that was yeah. a, just a two hour and 18 minute, really hard effort. I ended up doing a local 50 kilometer race outside Bozeman, old Gabe, which was the more specific from like the vertical gain and loss per mile, but not, I tried to keep it close to intensity, but it was definitely a higher, much higher intensity. Um, and that was a, yeah, a 50 K just over 50 K with 11,000 feet of climbing. And, and that was like the big, like mystery it was like, I didn't do a hundred mile race. I didn't do a 50 mile race. I didn't go out and do a hundred kilometer race. So there was this question mark of like, okay, you're, you're leveraging cross training as a tool to develop the engine. You're not really running a whole lot, like in the grand scheme of things, uh, for, for a tough mountainous hundred. And so what the heck are you doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that, again, that's what I kept getting. And I think part of it goes back to. You know, again, there's not one particular workout. There's not one particular yeah. block of training that's going to be this magical preparation for, for an event. So I drew a lot of strength from the fact that it's, it's taken me 10 years to get into this race. And I'm yeah. a pretty consistent athlete. I enjoy the heck out of getting out the door and moving. And I've been doing it. I've been healthy, knock on wood, for well over a decade. And so I leveraged the fact that I have that that good, strong foundation of consistent aerobic work over the years. And it was just a matter of just being excited and enjoying the training. I, I, 
I bring that up with athletes quite a bit. I think it's important when you're training for such a big event, like hard rock, that's taking you so long to get into is that it can be easy to put pressure on yourself to get out the door and do types of workouts that are like big and epic and that are going to like really break you down and build you back up. But I wanted to make sure that the process was super fun for me. And again, going back to the number one goal of getting to the start line, fresh and excited. I knew if I could get to the start line, healthy, fresh, excited, and with people, family, and friends that I care about, it's like, it's not going to be a piece of cake. No, yeah, it's always but hard. Yeah. that's like, that's the, that's the bread and butter. I, I, the fitness has been, it's, it's been a preparation over a decade, you know? Well, that's the thing, right? You yeah. just hit the nail on the head right there is that a lot of the context around why that training process and specifically what I'm mentioning about that is the amount of cross training that you're leverage leveraging and the lack of races that you were leveraging, right? You didn't have any races in advance of this. A lot of that is a byproduct of just the experience that you have. Which yeah. is not which is not trivial. I mean, you've been an endurance athlete for a long time. How many years have you done the bear? Like fifty? Ten. <laughs> Ten. Okay. Ten. You've done the bear. You've done the bear for exactly how many years that you've been waiting for uh, yeah. uh for hard nice. rock. So but I guess what I'm trying to say is is like you're no stranger to ultra marathons and you're certainly no stranger to mountain ultra marathons and you're certainly no stranger to training for these events. And yeah. all of that all of that experience plays into this theme of i know how much mileage i can handle or how much volume running volume specifically you can handle i know that i don't need a race and that's all that's wisdom speaking right there right i don't need some sort of prerequisite workout or race or whatever in order to prepare prepare for this thing even though it's unique to you you've never done the race before right you could have easily said oh i've got to go out and get on the first 50 miles of the course or kind of whatever it is like all that experience kind of plays through in this. No, I, I kind of know what I need to get to the start line, healthy, happy, and, and and excited about the proposition of, you know, getting around the loop around the San Juans. Right. Yeah. That's a good example. Yeah. That's a, that's a great point. Coop. I get that a lot with athletes too. It's like, Hey coach, like, you know, how do I know, like, what is that minimum amount of running yeah, 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 that, yeah. that I need to get in per week? You know, I really do like to ride my bike. I really do like ski mountaineering. Like, I want to keep that in the mix. Like what's that minimum dose of running that I can keep in. And I'm like, you know, that's where a little bit of that art comes in. Like you have to, that took me, that's taken me many, many years to figure out like, what is that amount of running that I can do each week where I feel really good. I'm feel fit. I'm healthy. It's sustainable, you know? And, and yeah, that, that takes time to kind of figure out. You can't just stumble upon it overnight. So so let, let's compare and contrast a little bit because this is going to be fun. Then you can pepper me with the questions. I don't care. Gotcha. So you, you had a program. I'm going to try to encapsulate the main themes here, right? You didn't start running until relatively late May, or you didn't start doing a lot of running until relatively late, which is May. And I'm pointing that time frame out very specifically because I'm going to bring up my training in May. <laughs> okay. Um, um, very little running. Yeah. Very, you, very, you, very, and, very and little that's running. That's all public on. I'm not a, you know, social media, but Strava is social media. Yeah. Yeah. We're not making a shit. Up. People can look at it. It's very little running up until May. Yeah. We're making, we're not making this stuff up. No. Um, so that's the first point. Second point, you're leveraging a lot of cycling. 50 50 or 60 40. 60% and running, 40% too. and skiing, right? I'm just trying to get yeah, some yeah. general bar, ballparks around it, but that's yeah. a big percentage of, of, of time cross training. Yeah. Um, you're getting to the race a couple of weeks in advance, but no, other than that, no prerequisite races or reconnaissance or anything like that. Well, a couple other, well, one thing to note with the, the getting there in advance, that kind of went, from the experience again with our no one's uh, attempt and me not being at altitude, my house is at 4,500 feet here in, in Helena, Montana. So I did want to set myself up for a chance at feeling hopefully okay above 12,000 feet or 11,000 feet. So yeah, getting down there was definitely, I, I told myself, if you're not going to jump into, you know, a 50 mile training race that has quite a bit of climbing, like get down there ahead of time, get, get used to the climbs, get a feel for how nutrition is going at, at altitude. 
So that was very much so part of my process going into Hard Rock was to get there in advance. And again, very lucky that I was able to get down there ahead of time for sure. Yeah. Uh, one other thing to note, Coop, was that I did add in that I know that we, you and I go back and forth with this and, and I think it helped. Yeah, it did help, but I did do strength training. Uh, I was really consistent with strength training really through ski season. And I kind of leveraged it ski this again, the ski training, um, and the, and the strength training that would go with ski training for, for the performance of my ski racing. But then I found like, I liked how it went. And so I just kind of kept it going. One thing I did do is about a month out, I started to taper that down. So I really, cause like we've talked about quite a bit is once that volume comes up, it's hard to really make the strength training worthwhile because you're just so tired. Yeah. So I ended up phasing out the strength training about a month out, but I did keep a pretty consistent tra- strength training in there for about, like I'd say five months at least. What'd you do? Upper body, lower body, the whole, the whole, the whole deal. I actually leaned towards a little bit of heavier weights. So I was doing quite a bit of heavyweight deadlift and squatting. I also realized that with the trekking poles, I wanted to make sure that my arms and felt strong. And so I did, yeah, pull-ups, I did push, you know, stuff like that, just to keep a bit of that upper body strength. And I did find that just anecdotally though, with the race that I was using the poles, I was really throwing my body weight over the poles. And I was very happy that I used my pole skiing. And then I also did a little bit of upper body weight. Cause I have heard people that their upper body is just wrecked after a big mountain race using poles. But. I'll, 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 th- I'll throw right. it back to that. That's probably your more, more of your skiing training than any sort of yeah, strength training because yeah, yeah, it's just sure. so specific. So yeah. need to, need to say this another compare and contrast we can talk about with the strength training side of things. So we've got not a lot of running until May, a whole, whole lot of cross training, some strength training up until the last month of the race. And then a couple of weeks where you're out there at altitude, getting acclimated to everything. Yeah. And, and I know you'll do max men, but my max running and I just mileage for simplicity was 90. I want to say it was like 93, like low nineties. Okay. Yeah. And then my lowest was like probably 10, like again, ski season, like two, two runs with a dog. So 10 yeah. miles or something. So that's a max min from the, just the running okay. standpoint. So I had almost like the opposite build. <laughs> where um, when I got into hard rock, I already knew and I I had already firmly committed to doing Cocodona. I did not think I was going to get into hard rock. I did not. Ha- I, I might have had one ticket, one or two tickets or something like that. I don't I can't. Yeah, I did not. I did, I did not have a lot. I can't remember right off the top of my head. I didn't have a lot of tickets. I was firmly committed to doing Cocodona and I'd already started kind of like that process of 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 getting ready for and then i get into hard rock and it and my point with mentioning that it is very much an after afterthought so you can you can you contrast that with i've been waiting for 10 years every year my name gets pulled in the lottery and i'm one millionth on the wait list and i'm never going to get in and the next year i'm 20th on the wait list and i might get in and there's some anticipation you know that whole like decade of waiting that you kind of mentioned I didn't really have that that level of enthusiasm because like I said, I had already committed to and kind of fully committed to doing Cocodona. And so my winter looked much, much different to where you were embracing all of the snow sports, you know, skiing and all the cross training and things like that. I was doing everything I could to get away from the snow because I had this race coming up in the early part of May which was a lot of running, right? Cocodon, it's in the desert. It's a lot of running. Yes, it's very difficult, but it's a lot of like, you know, just a lot of flat, you know, kind of flat running. And I live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And in the winter, you know, January, February, March, we get a lot of snow. We got like six inches of snow the week before Cocodona, the week before it. And so I'm going traveling out to Arizona during the same time that you're doing a lot of like skiing and things like that, I'm traveling down to Arizona in my van to get away from the snow so I can run more and slog up snow less. And to kind of like perfectly encapsulate that, I just had to pull this up while I was, um, uh, uh, while you were talking, John, the last week of May, while you were on your skis and, you know, bundled up and trying to, you know, put in as as much time, as much time as you can off running. 
The very last week in May, I did 165 miles over 34 and a half hours of running, 100% running, not one single second of cross trading. And it, once again, it was all in an effort to do this 200 and th this kind of like 250 mile race. But my point with that is, is my training by contrast, especially during the winter phases of February, March and April, and then, uh, well, February, March and April was a lot of running and very little hiking, zero cross training and a very small smidge of, of strength training. What I mean by a small smidge is two times a week, just on my, everything from my waist up, nothing waist from the waist up. Okay. Waist, that's how I divided it. Waist up, I can do waist down because I was running a lot, right? I mean, that, that's kind of the yeah. thing that you were mentioning on the last month is it's very hard to put in. I, you know, I'm doing, you know, between 20, 20 and 35 hours a week yeah. for six or eight weeks in a row. I'm pretty freaking tired by then. My legs don't want to handle any more running. And it's all, and it's almost all running. And I, I say that I use that in a very mode specific way where it's you not wouldn't a lot get of a lot of, You wouldn't get a lot out of the strength. If you tried to do heavy strength training, leg strength, you wouldn't, what would you get out of that? With 100, 165. Yeah. It's hard. To I mean, do. I would want to incorporate it. Like I'd, I'd look at times where I'd be like, okay, I can go in here. And it was convenient for me to do it. Cause I was using the gym and the sauna or I was using the sauna in the gym. Right. So I could easily kind of do it that way, but I just never, it, it, it was always last on the priority list and the last on the priority list always kind of like fell off the, you know, the, the side of the wagon, so to speak. Um, so you fast forward that to after Cocodona and you know this cause you've been in our coaching meeting, but also a lot of other, the, my other athletes that I've talked to and colleagues of mine that I've talked to, well, I was not motivated at all. So if you contrast that with this like level of excitement that you were having, that you were trying, that you were like intentionally trying to preserve yeah. throughout the training process, preserve which, it. Yeah. Is, yeah, which I thought is a really, a really poignant way to put it. My, my, my reserve of enthusiasm was completely depleted after Cocodona. The train, the training process took a lot out of me emotionally. Like I, oh, fully, so you're I, saying after, but what about during the process? During the process, I loved it. During the process, okay. I absolutely loved it. I loved packing up my van, right. driving down to Arizona or out to I went out to Moab once. I went out to Fruta a couple of times where the where where I had a little bit more dry terrain access. I absolutely loved the process in the middle of it. But after afterwards, after it was all kind of said and done, I was just emotionally exhausted. I didn't every time I saw my pack, I'd be like, screw you. I don't want to put you on. Like I had oh. you on my back for so long. Yeah. I don't want to fill up my freaking water bottles with scratch anymore. I don't want the taste of a pro bar bolt. I don't want to, you know, eat a waffle. I don't want to carry my poles anywhere. I don't want to put my freaking socks on to go run. Like every little element of the, yeah. that reminded me of the training and racing process was just a, a kind of an emotional drain. And so, and so much so that I was actually worried about that. Uh, probably a couple of weeks after Cocodon, I'm like, I'm not very excited mm. about, running hard rock and that's kind of scary as you know right because you're trying to do everything you, that you could to preserve it i was like i'm not very excited about this and i'm about to get into a very serious ordeal here where this race is you know going to chew me alive and i'm not enthusiastic enough to yeah. to, to, to 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 persevere so it, it became one of those things where um I wrestled with how much training to do in between those two. So to contextualize it, Cocodona was May, uh, May, yeah, May 2nd. Second. And uh, Hard Rock was just July 17th or 16th or 15th or something like that. Um, it's not, it hasn't been that long since the freaking race. I'm already oh, forgetting what day it is. <laughs> the middle of July, we'll put it that way. Bill of July. So that's not that, that long in between, right? And so what I wanted to do is I prioritized to your point, John, this is a page out of your book. I, I prioritized my enthusiasm over any sort of training that I could do. Um, I, I realized that I'd done obviously a lot of volume, not a lot of specificity, right. but a lot of, a lot of training volume, a lot of run volume. And I could lean on that as well as the experience that I had out on the course and the experience that I had out on the mountains. And that was going to be enough and that was going to be fine, but I was not going to be fine if I wasn't 
you know, if I wasn't reasonably, I wouldn't say extremely, if I wasn't reasonably enthusiastic about like towing the star line and having, and having a great day out there. So the, the training process from Coca-Dona to, to hard rock, which under normal circumstances to kind of go back to what you experienced, you're trying to do a lot of specificity at that point, right? You're trying to like, you're trying to hike, you're trying to do yeah. your long runs, you're getting out your poles, you're all that other stuff. You're, you're doing everything you can to prepare kind of for both the physicality and the psychological qualities of the, of the race. I kind of threw the physicality out the window and, you know, just rolled the dice on if I had enough, you know, physical stuff to complete the race. And I really focused on the, on more of the psychological side of things, just to make sure that I was enthusiastic about suffering for that long. Right. It kind of reminds me of like the athletes that do the grand slam where it's just kind of like, yeah, you're just so much in this recovery slash. Yeah. You're just trying to get your mind wrapped around getting back out there so soon. But I mean, Coop, just the, the, the build into Coca Dona, I mean, you were putting in huge hours. Like that was just like inspiring, but too, just like, I mean, again, I, my body would not tolerate that. That has its own physical and mental toll, just the training alone. But then to finish 250 miles, you've done Tour de Jean, yeah, which is a whole nother beast. That's almost like a hard rock on steroids. Um, <laughs> To a degree, yeah, and then you yeah. go and do a race that's pretty different. Like, I mean, Hard Rock. What, what's the vertical gain of loss per mile at Cocodono? Uh, it's like one hundred and ten, yeah, yeah. yeah, feet per mile or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the vertical comes later in the race, but still, Hard Rock's a dense. You're climbing, you're descending, you're climbing, you're descending. So, I could see where you were kind of leveraging, trying to get your head in it, as opposed to just getting out and trying to force your way through training. Well, here's how, here's how I knew it too. And I kind of course adjusted. I went out to the collegiate peaks, John, you're, you know, familiar with that. You and I spent some time out on the Nolan's course and I was going to do, cause it's convenient to me and there are 14 ers in my backyard. So I was going to put together a weekend and do like Columbia and Harvard and Yale and just kind of all those from the standard route. I could get 4,000 foot climbs, 4,000 foot descents in a very kind of easy session and you know i got out there and it was a little bit premature from a from a weather standpoint like there's still a lot of snow on the ground which normally doesn't bother me like normally whatever i'm used to snow travel i you know live in colorado springs and i travel around snow all the time but for whatever reason in this plays into like the emotional <laughs> training part of it I got out there and I'm like, I do not want to deal with this. I do not want to deal with trudging around in snow for the next two hours just so I can get to 14,000 feet and turn back around and trudge right back through this freaking right. snow field again. Like, and that taught me like instantaneously that taught me right there. I was like, you know what? I could go and I could like try to seek out all the dry climbs, you know, and try to be specific for hard rock and things like that. But if this one little stupid trivial thing is irritating me, when it would not normally irritate me, that's a sign that I really need to, like, I really just need to back off. And so that's exactly what I did. You know, I didn't do a whole, I did some training. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I put, you know, I'm smart. I did, I did some amount of training, but I certainly did not force it just because I, what I found is, is if the little things are irritating you, if you try to make it that much more serious, that's when it becomes really counter counterproductive. So yeah. I just let, you know, Smart. the the fitness sleeping dog lie and whatever fitness I built up yeah. into Coca Dona, I'm like, all right, this is going to be good. So I, it kind of the way that I've encapsulated it with a few different people is I had a lot of fitness, but zero specificity. So I had this huge right. base of training, not only through Coca Dona, but all the other years, you know, that you talked about, you know, very right. eloquently. I had this huge base of training, but not like hardly any of it, very, very, very little of a percentage of it was very specific to hard rock. Because as you know, for hard rock, it's all hiking on the uphills and hopefully all running on, all running on the downhills and very slow hiking at that on the uphills. It's not just normal it's hiking slow. because the altitude yeah. is very, very, very slow. Yeah. It, I, I didn't have that type of specificity you know, available to me. I had a lot of flat running specificity yeah. and I, I just it kind of wrapped my head around being okay with that. Yeah. I think that was a smart move to listen to your body when, you know, <laughs> if you were to force through, imagine if you just said, screw it and just grind it through 
like dense specific training when you really didn't want to be out there, that wouldn't be fun. And then you probably would have showed up even more tired and miserable and hating life and things like that. The the ace in the hole that I had though, is that I had two consecutive years of DNFing out there. And I, I really wanted to course correct that wrong. And it, retrospect okay. retrospectively for this year at least that ended up being a blessing in disguise because i was not as concerned about running xyz hour 30 hours or 34 hours or whatever i was more concerned about just getting to like like what you're saying getting to the star line one piece enthusiastic about the proposition and just letting everything else kind of like take care of itself whereas previously you know, I'm not the most pretentious person in the world about my performances or whatever, but you know, when you've got a couple of performances out there, it's always nice to run, not your worst, certainly not your worst, but, you know, try to like beat whatever you've done before. And I've got, you know, history out on that course to, to, to earmark that to, uh, um, uh, to, to, a, to a certain extent. So I kind of threw all that out the window. Like I just, you know, I yeah. didn't know if it was going to take me 40 hours. I thought it was going to take me about 36 hours ish, but I really didn't know. And I was yeah. okay with whatever finish that I could actually muster up because I wanted to first and foremost, kind of correct the, the DNFs from the years previous. Right. Um, uh, that was most, most, most apparent on my mind. And do you think that helped you kind of going in with a little bit lower expectations from just the, like I say, simple, it's not always simple, but just do the loop and kiss the rock, but to make that your, your goal of just like getting well, it done. Or... I think it, I think it helped, but I, I took a page out of something that you and the rest of our coaches will, will, will recognize very readily is I did not downgrade the goal to quote, just unquote finish. Right. I recognize that that is just as important and as significant of a goal as finishing in a very specific time or setting a PR or whatever. Like I do mean it when I say that the finish was just as important as any, you know, spectacular, yeah. you know, graded performance that I've that you know that that I've had in my uh, in, in my running career, and I wanted to be very deliberate about that. So. I didn't get lazy out on the course. I didn't get lazy in the couple of weeks beforehand with, you know, my sleep or my diet or kind of anything like that. Like I just, I wanted to make sure that I treated the, the finish or the goal of finishing yeah. with just as much respect as I had with any other thing that I've kind of put on front of me, even though I've done it before, even though I'm experienced on the course, even all this other, other kind of stuff, because I knew that we're, we're going to get into the, we're, we'll probably get into this now. I knew that the course is so hard that the instant you let your guard down is the instant that the failure points start to come into the equation. Oh yeah. Um, And it's unrelenting and there are innumerable places where you can let your guard down and have it and kind of have those and have those things happen. I knew that because I'd been out on the course and I'd, I'd done that before. And so I was not going to resolve into those same into, into that same mistakes of thinking, well, oh, just because I'm a reasonably good athlete and just because I've been out here, I can finish kind of whenever I could. I, I was not right. taking that for granted at all. Right. Oh, hundred percent. And like we've talked about the course is pretty relentless and you know, it's nature of just up and down the whole way, the altitude, I'd say that the num- number one theme that I heard from runners post race is, is, uh, well, handies came out a lot of mm. runners, I had a hard go up and over handies to Burroughs, which Burroughs is at mile 68, leaving at the new aid station Animus Forks at about 58. Then you get it up over 14,000 feet. A lot of people, it's at, at you know, dark. Uh, I think the leaders might have just got over there just as the sun, or no, it was definitely light out still for sure. Yeah. 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 But um, either way, I mean, just the altitude has a big impact on the overall system, the body, hydration. Uh, you know, eating is a lot harder once you get up above 12,000 feet. And, uh, I don't know about you, but I I definitely had some, some issues out there. You know, I think a lot of athletes, you know, like, wow, you did great. Awesome job. You were top 10 at hard rock, but 
by any means, it was not smooth sailing. Like I had, I had a rough, really, really rough patch out there, you know? Yeah. And that was the one thing I did going into the races. I planted the seed weeks going in that you're most likely going to have a rough patch. You are going to have a rough patch at some, at some point, point, right? Yeah. At some point, yeah. but you have the experience, you have the calm to be able to work through that, you, you know, and, and, and that's the way I approached it. Even though I was in a, in a pretty hard spot, I didn't panic. You know, yeah. I, I didn't panic. I was like, it's okay. Okay. You're, you're not able to eat right now. That's all right. You can keep, you can take another step. And so I think it was that the mindset I had about just kind of like, okay, here's the low patch. Here's the struggle. I'm not the only one going through this. There's other people out there that are having a, a rough go at some point, whether it's stuck in a storm or they can't eat or whatever it is, you're going to be okay. You know? And I think it was just this like state of mind that I had that somehow it actually, it, it brought me back to the Nolan route too, where I was really sick, but uh, I was able to just kind of work through it, not with ease, but with just like, yeah, acceptance. I accepted the fact that, okay, you know, this isn't, going smoothly. I'm having a rough patch. This is what hundred mile mountain ultra running is about is that you're going to work through it and you're going to be okay. <laughs> let me ask you, let me ask you this though, because I'm going to humble you for a little bit. You've had other bad patches at races. Oh, lots, lots, lots. lots. <laughs> okay. Many, many, many. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. was it any different at hard rock compared to some of those other races? And if so, what was the difference? Yeah, it, I mean, it it wasn't different in in what was happening. It, it was GI. It was I was not able to eat. I was throwing up, so that was definitely. It wasn't like my quads were blown or anything like this. That's typically been my uh, a limiter with me, specifically with hundred mile mountain races. Just been able to fuel and keep energy. Um, but it was just that. Yeah, it was again. It was the mindset that I had and the way that I the self talk that I had through that, that low patch was quite different than what I've had before. Did you intentionally cultivate that though, because of those previous experiences or were you just kind of like looking at the course going, I, I just know this is going to happen. So I might as well start preparing for yeah. it. Yeah. It was, it, I think it was a combination of both. Yeah. It was a combination of experiences at altitude experiences at other hundred mile races, the bear, which I've had quite, quite a few, quite a bit of experience at and some, uh, episodes where I'm not able to eat and also have gotten quite sleepy. Um, but yeah, it was just a matter. Maybe it was again, the whole, this whole theme of the experience and drawing from experience that I have and, and running and racing and working with athletes and things like this, that I was able to just keep, uh, keep calm and not, not really panic. And I think that helped me, step outside of any narrative that I find in previous races that would start to kick in. It's like, Oh my God, you're falling behind, or this is your race is oh, whatever that none of that negativity came up. So I almost looked at like by me not being able to move forward quickly or me not being able to eat. Yeah. There was like positivity in it. It was really strange. <laughs> like, this is exactly what I expected it to be. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> this is okay. I'm like, I'm throwing up right now. That That's totally Perfect. fine. Perfect. Yeah. This is exactly it, what I expected. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> so again, it could, it, it, you know, other folks could have taken it quite a different way and that could have been a lot more time out in the course working through it. For me, I was able to kind of like somehow work through it. And then I was throwing down breakfast burritos and like, it, it was a strange time. It, 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 I say time, it was pro it probably lasted about, it was probably about six hours yeah if this wasn't just like an hour deal it was a six hour kind of i always move i've i've kind of adopted this phrase that uh justin ross uh, mm -hmm. imparted upon me about a year ago when he and i were talking about uh, this thing so justin's been a guest on the podcast before he kind of helped me craft the mental skills chapter of the book um, and I'll, I'll leave a link in the show notes to the, to the podcast that he, that he was on very, very well-known endurance sports awesome psychologist, guy. awesome guy. He's coming to our coaching group and done a number of continuing ads. He's hopefully going to write this book. I'll goad him into that. Hopefully he gets a hold of this audio That's clip, <laughs> goes him into it a little bit more, but works with ultra marathoners and all different ki kinds of endurance athletes. And he, he would always say, you have to accept reality but you can always work back towards optimism. 
And uh, what he mean, what he meant by that is is in the middle of it when you're trying when you're puking and throwing up and you know for me personally I was really discombobulated and just dizzy you know and just trying just kind of like suffering whatever whatever your ailment is it's okay to go you know what this is what I'm dealing with right now I'm not awesome I'm not a good runner. I'm really slow. I feel like crap. I haven't eaten in two hours. I just puked up my last four gels on the side of the trail. Like if that's the reality, it's okay to, it's okay to like live in that reality for a second, but you can always work back to here's how I'm going to fix it. I'm just going to move down the trail and it's going to fix itself. I'm going to keep going. Like you can always move back towards that optimistic part and at the same time, not fool yourself in the reality of the situation in the situation that you're in that you're in right there and i i used to before i met justin the reason i'm laughing at this um i used i used to always give this and i still do i give this quote to athletes is that it never always gets worse right at some point it's going to get better now that some point might be at the end of the race it might be 10 feet yeah. from where you're at right now but it never always gets worse so whatever right. you're experiencing right that right there and right right then and right there it's never going to always continue to to escalate downwards it'll get yeah. better at some point and i think kind of like both of those themes is something that you can for especially for a race like hard rock you can really kind of take to heart because even the best maybe outside of killian but even francois right, as we were talking about earlier yeah. they're going to have these moments of Hey, my stomach hurts. My, you know, this gel didn't go down well. I got off trail. That happened to a number. That happened to me. That happened to a number of other people. Yeah. 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 Um, I think that that a certain degree, like this acceptance of reality, and that is not going to be awesome all the time, is just a necessary evil of the process. One hundred percent. If you're comparing your current reality or experience to this ideal, right? <laughs> I thought I was going to be crushing it up, up. Uh, yeah, and he's peaking now. I suck. <laughs> but again, that's where we start to deal. How are we going to deal with the situation? Then it's going to be stressful. It's going to be pre- yeah. You're going to. So I think you're right on that. Just accepting the experience. I also in my I was very grateful to have Jeff Rome, uh, a friend uh, who ended up pacing me out there. He was he's all he's been second at Hard Rock actually. Uh, he lives in Silverton and he was like super calm, super relaxed. Like it's going to be, he's been there. He's been like, Oh, this is normal, dude. Yeah. Yeah. But but it it was, it was the perfect, (laughs) you know, to not, you know, be so fixated on just that the fact that I was throwing up or not feeling well. And he brought up the fact that like, Oh, it's super still right now or, you know, like, so I think the other thing that some athletes can take away is if you're having a low patch, you know, that's not all that's there, right? <laughs> There's more to your reality than just yeah. like, oh, I can't eat like, you know, the, the stillness and the still night or the moon or whatever it was. So I did use that to work through it. And it was a matter of time. Like you said, he come to the other side and I was eating burritos at six in the morning and <laughs> Previous to that, you're puking everything up. <laughs> it was crazy. I, I did go into the race, wow. and a lot of people at my crew were really, I could tell they were a little nervous. I went into the race with the idea that I was going to eat more solid food yeah, yeah. and then liquid calories. And I was actually surprised at how long I held on to eating solid food. Um, the idea with this was to, if the thought of eating solid food sounds like a bad idea, you're, you're, you're going too hard. You're don't going too quick. You need to slow down. Mm, <laughs> oh, it's like a governor for you. It was a governor. So I was like, you know, eating <laughs> ba- you know, having a little bit piece of bacon, having so up Oscars. I mean, I was, I was having a pancake and bacon up Oscars, which is pretty early in the race. Yeah, that is early. I had the, the one mistake and that I made nutritionally was I had a milkshake at, at, at URA and I had it just, I, I, I sucked it down too quick. And then I was out of there. It, so um, if I would, yeah, kind of change a few things from a nutrition standpoint, it would have been maybe a little bit more smaller bite size pieces instead of. We can, we can pull on that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've always found that the biggest change that I make with athletes that go into something like hard rock and then 
Western States has a little bit of the same flavor. You'll have to excuse the pun, but ba bad water, it's, it's very, very similar to this. Is that they're consuming the same amount of calories total. We're just dosing it in smaller doses and, mm -hmm. and trying to be really deliberate in those, in those smaller doses. And, and kind of the reason for this and the longtime listeners, not the longtime listeners of the podcast, if you listen to the podcast last week, yeah, right. <laughs> um, I, I spoke with Meredith Turnover, which is just in advance of, of hard rock. And that was one of the themes that came out of that podcast is that at high altitude races, because your physiological bandwidth is taken up to a greater extent by the altitude you have you have fewer resources to therefore digest food and one of the consequences of that is having to take in smaller doses of calories because your gi system just can't handle it because of the physiological load yeah I um but, but that's the thing that i took to heart is i would honestly john like you know you're talking about how much you're using your poles I had the very same experience of where I was like cranking on my poles, but every 20 minutes I'd put two of them in one hand and I'd reach into my pocket and I'd take out two bolts and I'd just eat the bolts as slowly as I could, like as absolutely as slowly as I could trying to like digest the calories as slow as possible with two poles in one hand. And I just kind of like chug along, like knowing I'm just carrying up, you know, dead weight at this point with my, with, with my trekking poles. But I was okay with that trade off because I wanted to take the calories in at a slower rate and in slower bits, essentially, or smaller bits Yeah, that I was okay with not using my, with using my poles that much, which I did leverage the heck out of the entirety of the entirety uh, of the race. Yeah. You have to use your poles at hard rock. Yeah, um, it's a big one. Yeah, that's you did that from the start, or you did that from the start, from the from very the start. start. Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, I took some pizza in at mm. uh, Animus Forks, and I took some other like bits and pieces of real food uh, at uh, Telluride and oh. uh, uh, and Ure, but the first kind of like real not meal, so to speak. I actually, I actually hiked up Handies with pizza, so I ate a slice okay. at Animus Forks, which is formerly Grouse. And then I ate another slice very slowly up American Grouse Pass. And then I descended and then I tried to eat it. I ate pretty much the entirety of the next one up Handy's Peak in a couple of different fits, fits and starts, but that that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Um, let, let's get into this, man. So we've all, we mentioned the course is hard. I'll, I'll, and I'll start on the, this one and I want to give you, and then you can kind of give me your opinion on it. It's hard because of everything. And, and here's what I mean by that. I know that sounds like stupid and cliche and whatnot, but it's hard because you're at an average elevation of 11,000 feet. It's hard because the climbing is very slow at times. I mean, even for the fast people, you're going a mile or a mile and a half an hour yeah. up some of those passes. You're not covering a lot of the terrain comes, but you have to earn the terrain, I guess is what I'm saying. There's very few 100%. gimme, what I would call gimme miles, right? Yeah. Where you just kind of just fall down or whatever. The descending is hard as well in both directions. It's very muscularly taxing because of the, yeah. because of the steepness of it. Um, it's also hard because there are weather considerations. I got drenched, completely drenched at one point, total hail. The people, me and the people around me, we hunkered down underneath a tree to like relieve ourselves from getting, relieve ourselves from getting pelted and, yeah. and, and welted by the, by the hail that was coming down. But in addition to that, you can also contrast that with coming down into your ray and tell your ride can be quite hot. You know, it's in the eighties, yes. which is, which is hot in the summer. And I yeah. guess my point with all that is, is you, you get a little bit of everything. And I know this kind of sounds like, like bitching and moaning, but it, it's, it's kind of hard at every stage. And there's not a lot of stages where you can, there's not a lot of stages during the race where you can really back off and say, okay, I'm going to regroup here. Because when you get to that, instead of regrouping like any other race, you can regroup and just still kind of muddle down the trail and chew up some miles. You're regrouping and you're going zero miles an hour. Yeah. I, that, I think that's one of the material differences is that 100%. everything, everything is hard. Everything is slow. And when you need to regroup, you can't, it's very difficult to do it at 
any speed at all and you end up just sitting on a rock which i did a lot of times just yeah. sat on a rock and regrouped oh 100 percent, coop i mean it's it's a race where you can easily leave hours and hours and hours out on the course just because like you said you get stuck in a lightning storm or you know you you're not able to eat and you don't have power to go uphill so you go from one mile per hour to 0.5 or whatever it is you know um <laughs> And I think that's why if you look at the history of the race, I mean, sure, we've seen the times get faster, but not significantly. I mean, they've gotten faster. It's pretty, pretty yeah. fast to see what they're doing, but still, there's such, yeah, 21 hours on there. It's like, what the, uh, they're taking advantage of every little section there to, yeah. to run the, the little dips. But yeah, it really is a race that you have to just prepare yourself the best you can for all the little elements that you're going to be up against. Um do you want to yeah. guess what my run, walk, and idle distribution was? Run, idle. So, I mean, so, I mean, so I know how how much. So I have a thirty-four hour finish. We'll just round the time where I'm giving myself the benefit of rounding down. No way, a thirty-three thirty-three hour time. Um, what my run time was, what my what my walk time was, and what my idle time was. How many hours? It, it's reason. Run? It's reasonably accurate. Yeah, you want to take a guess at it. I would say you ran 13 hours. That's pretty close. Yeah. 11 really? hours. Yeah. 11, 11 hours. hours of running. No way. Yeah. And that's pretty, you're, you're, you're finding that's pretty accurate. Yeah. That's yeah, it's, cl yeah. it's close enough. I mean, it's not nine and it's not, it's not 15 hours, but yeah, 11 hours of running. Okay. Now, so what do you think, the, what do you think curious, the walk many, time is? How many logs and rocks you sat on? Yeah. Well, I'll get, so we'll get into that. So I have almost three hours of idle time. Three. Some of some of that is because you're just going so slow, it's counting as idle, right? You're still kind of like moving along the right. trail. But I mean, I had, you know, I spent a good chunk of time in Burroughs Park underneath a blanket trying to like get my head to stop spinning. Uh, I don't know how much time, time that was specifically. I'm sure some aid station volunteer can attest to how you long can, I was. You can pull the splits up. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure I did do that before this. But, um, um, you know, I mean, it just goes to the point, like you can look at that intellectually and say, ah, oh, you could easily go three hours faster if you just don't stop. Well, that's not entirely possible, right? Just because it's so hard and you're going to have to stop it. You're going to have to stop at some point. But what I really take away from that is, is it's two thirds walking and one third running. When you get down to the run walk distribution, right? I had 21 hours of running or tw sorry, 21 hours of walking and 11 hours of running. Right. Go look at your training and see if that is the mode distribution that you actually trained for. It's usually the opposite. Right. Right. A hundred percent, you know, and a hundred percent coop. And, and that, again, that, that's where, again, going back to cross training, you might disagree with this and that's totally fine, but I find that, that, that tr that transfers a little bit that not to say that biking is hiking or anything like that but it's definitely not running <laughs> you yeah. know and i think so if we're looking at a race like hard rock that has all these elements that has this distribution of you're not running purely running that much yeah you see folks come from all different backgrounds that do really well at, at a race like hard rock that don't run a lot in training yeah you know, well, because it's not a lot of running. I mean, exactly. here, here, here's the counter. Here's the counter, like not the, not the counter argument to this, but like the polar opposite. I was great at the running parts. Oh, you said like, all the Creek, flat your stuff. Sections. That's Pol, pretty Creek. I was great. Yeah, yeah I was yeah. great at Pole Creek. I was great right. at any of the you know other flat. But there's just not a lot of them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, you know, <laughs> even Pole all... Creek was like pretty boggy and like yeah. Wet, you know, like, but the downhills I could do. Right, because I had all yeah. the run training downhills. I could do. I could do fine. I'm a Camp good Burr, downhill. Did you run that? You ran yeah, that? yeah, yeah. I ran all Camp Burr. Those are if the, if there are yeah. any. I was fighting. I mentioned this to several people. Basically, from uh, Oscar's Pass. So just after Chapman. Yeah. Uh, for those of the unfamiliar, that's not that, not that 18, long 18 into the miles, race. Man. Eighteen miles yeah. in the race. I was struggling from there all the way to Burroughs Park. Like it was just a fight every single friggin' mile but my, yeah. my point my point with that is 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 like when we're looking at we're, we're really looking at any race but specifically something that's very specific like hard rock we have to take a hard look at the mode distribution 
And then to your point, John, of how much cross training can actually matter, right. deter determine based on that mode distribution, does cross training or this type of training or that type of training make a whole lot of sense? Because it absolutely it absolutely manifests itself during the race. And those are the, those people out there, and there's going to be all of, you know, a lot of them are going to be listening to this podcast right here. Absolutely know that they were passing me on the climbs because I did not do any or very little specific <laughs> steep hiking during training yeah. and during this, during the descents and during the flats, I could go and pass them back. And it just happened to be that there's more, there's a bigger percentage of time climbing. Uh, yeah. Then there are then there are descending and flats and so over the course of a long race they have more advantage than i do because their advantage is a greater percentage of the whole so right. it, i mean that that's why i mentioned that is is that retrospectively i think it's important that, you know i finished in the top 20 right and i'm still have two-thirds walking two-thirds of the race that's crazy walking yeah. and it, so anyway I, we we i think if the so the listeners out there can take note of that and take a hard look at what you think your mode distribution is going to be between running and hiking during a race and try to emulate that as much as possible because it does end up being a, a it does end right. up making a big difference huge difference and it all just to note it doesn't have to be a race that has a lot of climbing like bad water yeah. for example it's you know i don't want to say it's flat there's quite a bit of climbing at the end but there's going to be they a lot, of, a lot walking of walking yeah because yeah. it's hot yeah freaking hot as heck freaking hot so yeah, I, you know, I had an athlete finish a uh, 10th female there I was pretty stoked on that as competitive, but we did a lot of run walk yeah. transitions back and forth, back and forth, even though she was capable of continuous running, it was like, nope, we, <laughs> we need to get that transition dialed in. So definitely looking at that breakdown, I think is huge. And, and then again, you know, with a race that's so extreme, like hard rock that you are going to hike quite a bit, you know, maybe there is a little bit of creativity with your approach. Maybe you do end up leveraging a tool like biking or maybe it's skiing in the winter for preparation. You know, I would say that that might replace a run session because like Coop just mentioned, you're not going to run a whole lot. So, well, but you got to look at good, it's good, better, best, right? Yeah. So best would be two thirds hiking, one third running in my situation, right? If I could arrange all my specific training in the last 10 weeks of the race, two thirds hiking and one third running, that would be kind of the, the quote unquote best. Yeah past that what's the best right no wait wait good better best right what's better <laughs> then i think you can kind of make this argument for maybe a type of cross training is better than running because certainly yeah. running right if i just i've got an athlete that's training he wouldn't mind me mentioning this he's training for tour de jean and he lives on the island of anguilla which sure. nobody's ever heard of it yeah exactly yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> it's, it's in the Caribbean. Okay. It's, it's 14 miles long and three miles wide. It's very, very, very wow. tiny. Yeah. Very tiny Island as part of the British territories. And, uh, he's training for Tour de Jean, which is way harder than hard rock, way harder. Sorry, everybody who finished hard rock Tour de Jean's yeah. way harder. Yeah. Um, and he has to do a lot of creative training. We've got him on the step mill. We've got him doing, you know, hikes around the island and kind of just whatever, whatever he can do. But I guess my point with, with that is, is the better part of the equation, you can look at what other activities might be more specific to that hiking mode. And I would say certainly flat level running is one of the least favorable candidates for that in terms of specificity to the mode or the biomechanical specificity right. to that to that specific mode not 100%. that it's bad right oh. i would still say that that's a good option if all you and here's my case right i basically ran because i was training for coca dona that's that's a good a good well, especially option. from a time standpoint too yeah. right like from an energy expenditure if you're going to go run for an hour yeah so just a general way to get fit running is yeah. a good option but if we're trying to get more specific to the mode think outside the box, yeah. you know, like you said, maybe it's a day a week where you're doing the stair master, which there's some crossover to the muscle engagement and the type of, yeah, the type of muscles that you're going to be using that crosses over to hiking. Yeah. I, I, I think that that's a, that's worthy consideration in races that have s such a large percentage of hiking as part of the mode. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I would say, 
I mean, this is get, we're getting outside of the box of Hard Rock at this point, which is yeah, inevitable. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I would say that for like for your example of bad water, right? Like, I would rather just have somebody do a run walk on flat level terrain than trying to yeah. in, induce some sort of like kind of like cross training because of the biomechanical specificity. But for something where hiking is a very specific part of the mode, and if you've got other modalities that can better emulate hiking as opposed to flat level running, I mean, that's a logical substitute at that point in my in my estimation yeah well and the other one why i went to the bike as well because again i wasn't able to access high country mm, so yeah. i was only my climbs if i were to, if yeah. were to actually hike or run yeah. were 20 minutes but on the bike yeah. i could grind away for an hour uphill yeah. you know so the muscles that i was engaging for an hour compared to 20 minutes yeah it, it just made sense. Um, another athlete that I actually follow quite a bit, you might know him, Troy Howard. Yeah. He's, he's run hard rock quite a bit and he's done quite well there. And, and I remember listening to a few interviews of him and he comes from a similar background where he actually uses the bike quite a bit in his training. Um, he, he says he goes out and he rides up Mount Evans. He does, you know, well over 10,000 feet of vertical on his bike. And again, it's all anecdotal. There's no research that we can point at that says, Hey, biking is going to transfer. I'd love to see that research. And hopefully that comes about because I'm seeing a lot more athletes in the ultra running world that are leveraging these tools. So it'd be interesting to see what is that crossover? What is that transfer of fitness from that other mode with these extreme races that it, the breakdown is definitely leaning more towards hiking. Um, and when we look at the top three or Dakota, I think Dakota skis, I don't know, but uh, Francois obviously <laughs> spends a lot of time on skis, but uh, no, it's, it's, it's an interesting subject and I wish it's not easy to do research on, but I'm sure we could get some subjects. Yeah. So, but uh, you can take the opposite approach and say those athletes don't do very well at a running race like Western States. hundred percent. Right? So it's gotta be, yeah. so you have, once again, I think the key with this, with evaluating this is looking at how, what the mode distribution is how important that is in the actual race in terms of what percentage are you spending doing this mode or that mode. Right. And then looking at the kind of the training arsenal that you have and figuring out if there are activities outside of running, whether we want to call them, you shouldn't be calling them cross training at that point, right? Yeah. Whether there are activities outside of running that are just more about mechanically specific to the mode in question. That's the way right. that I would evaluate yeah. the problem is, is it not, okay, is cycling good or bad, right? I would say, is cycling appropriate given the mode that the athlete is actually going to race in? And I mean, you can look at the mechanics of that. I mean, that's not, although you're right, John, the research hasn't been done to say, eh, if we have a cyclist training 10 hours a week and a runner training 10 hours a week in cycling and a runner training 10 hours a week in running, how are they going to perform in XYZ, you know, condition or whatever? But you can look at the biomechanics, right? I mean, there have been a lot of biomechanical studies at different grades. That's very well established research. And trust me, as somebody who's looked at a lot of the biomechanics of cycling, there is a lot of biomechanics out there where you can look at that and say, okay, your hip angles, this, your knee angles, that your foot angle is this, is that equivalent to uphill grade kind of X, Y, or Z. And the general theme of that is, is it's not too far off. I mean, it's not exactly, but it's, it's certainly, I would say it's certainly more about mechanically specific than flat level running. Once you get above about a 10 or 12% grade. Yeah. And, and, and everyone we're talking about uphill, not downhill that presents its yeah. own yeah. unique yeah. situation. But, uh, but that's an interesting point. Time spent hiking was really high. And you didn't do a lot of hiking. The only thing that I was oh, I to, sucked at it too, man. I knew it. The only, the only thing that you maybe could have done, and again, we're kind of in hindsight here, but looking through the trees is you could have maybe split your training. So maybe done a little bit less specific Cocodono training and incorporated, you know, say 50 50. So, oh, shoot, I got hard rock. I've got Cocodono. Kind of like how Killian is approaching his whole craziness with doing, you know, 100 mile race. There's Zagama, Hard Rock, Sears and all, UTMB, this whole thing, right? How do I, how do I kind of, you know, train for these, these changes of intensity, changes of terrain, but maybe working in two sessions a week where you're hiking well, farther out, he, even yeah, though it's far here's, out, you know? Here's the deal though. Like I was okay with 
taking a little bit of the performance off of the table for hard rock. I, okay. I was okay with that yeah. because I knew that I, I was just prioritizing Kogodona a lot higher on the list because it was a novel race for me. Right. You know, I hadn't done it before. It was only a second year race. I was really excited about the proposition of doing it. And so I, I get what you're saying. I, I did think about hedging my bets, so to speak, in that in that fashion. But I was okay with the ding that I was going to take. Right. I mean, and, and that's a conversation that I had. I just had that conversation with an athlete. The so the one that I had right before I got on the phone with with you, John, to record yeah. this. We had that exact same conversation. You've got these four races lined up. Where do you want to take the compromise? Because we can right. tailor things this way or that way. They're not all that similar and. You got to yeah. tell me how you're prioritizing them. And, and and I think that's an important conversation to have because we're not all as talented as Kelly and can just kind of go right. win everything irrespective of whatever else is, go, is going on. Like I, I can apply specificity. It's going to, and it's going to matter and it might matter at the, at the detriment to, to, to something else down the line. Right. hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. What would you do differently? I mean, what I'm going back to nutrition, I think the big thing that I took away was I would not down a, a large milkshake at URA. <laughs> um, no, I, I really would still take in solid food. I would just do the nibble nibble, uh, smaller, actually Kelly, uh, from rad Boulder. She was actually giving out little quiches at the start. Oh, I saw that. I, I, saw I did that. have a little quiche, but that concept of mini little yeah, pieces of food yeah. i would take that into heart instead of just like having like slices of pizza and just big things of food uh i would just break them into small little bite size nibble nibble <laughs> sip sip man and nibble nibble sip sip i just went a little bit too aggressive with uh calories at once so yeah it's never going to be perfect man no. i mean you know, as experienced as you are, you're always going to be able to look back on things and find ways to optimize it. So all in all, though, I mean, I, I know what type of runner you are because you and I have run together for so oh, many miles. Totally. You could probably go a couple hours faster, but your first yeah. or your first foray out there, that's about all you could expect. You know, Right. Totally. Yeah. First experience. So I think it'd be cool to go back and do it the other direction and see what we can do. But. What are you going to impart on to your athletes after all this? Oh, I know what I wanted to talk about. Um, one of the things, sorry, I'm just completely no like losing thought and like coming. I just mentioned yesterday, I had like a hard time intellectually, like just working yesterday. Maybe it's trickling in, trickling into the, to today. One of the things that I, that kind of, I went, that went underappreciated since we've been talking about Cocodona and Tour de Jeant. Um, with my race uh, specifically is because I had those experiences, which are far longer and more arduous. And you're kind of just putting yourself out there for a longer period of time than hard rock. And specifically with Tour de Jean, where I was really suffering for like nearly three days, just having a really hard time out there. When I got into a bad patch at hard rock, I'm like, okay, I've only got 40 miles left. Like that's like yeah. whatever that's going to take me 20 hours at the very most. Like that's not that big of a deal. Like I that's, I've suffered for like way longer than that. So the scope of like how long you can be miserable for, like my scope on that has changed because I remember the first time I did hard rock, like kind of how you mentioned the first time I got into a really bad patch. The only thing I can think of was I'm only here 50 miles or whatever it was. I've got 50 miles to go. I'm going one mile an hour. I'm not going to make the cutoffs. Like the, the, that was the logical thought right. process because I'd felt so bad and not, and not, oh, I've done this before and never always gets worse. I'm eventually going to work myself out of this bad patch and it'll be fine. I just didn't have that, Yeah, you know, that, that scope of experience to actually realize that the first time out of the gate. And this, this time I actually did to where it didn't, I was really bad at Pandy's Peak. You just ask anybody who was around I, me at the time. I was really yeah, bad. Yeah, <laughs> was really, really bad. Well, Coop, I looked Peak. at your split because they have splits, and and I was really bad. And we had like the same exact split. Yeah. yeah. From uh, Animus Fort. We were both really bad. Like, you oh, finished. Okay. You, must, you must have been hurt. I was I was really bad up up yeah. up 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 yeah. Pandy's Peak, but it never bothered me because I was I had the experience of being 
way more miserable for a longer period of time and having a long, lo- a lot longer to go. Yeah. So it was just like, okay, I'm just going to friggin' yeah, get sit, it, on this, back. sit on this rock for a bit and then I'm going to get up and I'm going to start moving down the trail very slowly. Well, cool. And, and just like we touched on earlier, it's acceptance. You're accepting yeah. that, hey, this is the experience that I'm having. It's, this is okay. Like, yeah. you know, and that can save you so much time and, and, yeah. and make it kind of enjoyable too, even though in the moment you're like, oh my yeah. God. So, yeah. Okay. So let's get back to what were we going to part and part on our athletes? after this experience you your first time doing hard rock me my third time doing hard rock both very yeah. different end points that we were coming to 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 for, for for what was it the end of the day not that dissimilar of an experience we we're both terrible but hard rock we we're only separated by a couple of hours or whatever yeah. but what are you going to ultimately kind of take away from this to impart on your athletes yeah well i mean just like getting into the race because i have a lot of athletes that i work with that maybe it's not hard rock, it's, you know, Western States or UTMB, you know, if it's an, if it's an event, if it's something that you really care about and you want to do is to keep at it. You know, it took me 10 years to get into the race. And so I think that's important to kind of have that just to kind of persevere with that, like, yeah, throwing your name in the hat and maybe it's not, maybe you miss a year, that's fine, but maybe you get to get out on the course and run the course or something like this. So I, I think just like, keep that, like that no quit kind of stick with it attitude of trying to get into the event. Cause I think that, that, that provides a lot of energy. Once you do toe the line, it's just, yeah, it's, it's pretty special once you do toe, toe the line. Um, and then just like we've touched on Coop, I think you're going to, you know, you train to kind of minimize the, the odds of a low patch happening or things like this, but it's, it, there's a good chance it's still going to happen. And I think just being accepting of the fact that you, you might feel bad, you're most likely going to feel bad at some point and just know that you have the the mental skills and the tools to be able to work through it. And I think that's, that's part of the game. You know, that's what I got from hard rock is that everyone out there, I didn't talk to one person that said, Oh, Nope. It was smooth sailing the whole way up. Yep, felt great. <laughs> No way, you know? So I think if you can plant that seed going in, it's going to make the experience that much more enjoyable. We sound like such pessimists, that, but that's the yeah. thing that I came, that I kind of came yeah. to the conclusion with as well. And I kind of came to this in, in, in advance of the race and that it's, it's never perfect. Your training is never going to be perfect. Yeah. Your preparation is never going to be perfect. The week before the race, when you're traveling out there, that's not going to be perfect. Your luggage might get lost or, right. you know, you might be, not be able to find your perfect, you know, gluten-free, organic, soy-free, lactose-free pizza in advance of the race that's made with <sighs> unicorn tears or whatever, you know, specificity that you want to right. put on your last meal. Like all, like it's, 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 it's never, never, never going to be perfect. You're always going to look back and find something that you can improve upon something, some kind of like bump in the road. But the point of training to to ping off of your theme, John, is to be good enough to deal with those imperfections and to have them not turn into catastrophic events. Right. That's really what you're trying to do with training in an event like Hard Rock, where finishing is the goal. It's the goal for everybody except for a very small handful of people in the race, maybe three on each side of the field, the women's yeah. in the mid side of the field. Oh. For everybody else, training is about trying to minimize the damage and trying to minimize the amount of impact at those small imperfections, wherever they are, whether it's during the race or during training, actually have on the race yeah. itself. And certain people, you've got a lot of bandwidth, right? We we're both very fortunate that we're reasonably talented endurance athletes. And ours, have, ours, we can still get a 48 hour finish and be far from perfect. And it would still be very, very, very hard. And not everybody wow. is in that position, but irrespective of that, I think the point of training is to make sure that all of those imperfections don't mount up to not finishing a race that at least you have enough wherewithal to cover them up, so to speak. Yeah. Showing up every day, what's possible. What can, you know, I, I bring this up to my athletes all the time. What's possible? I don't know. Let's go find out. Yeah, right? there you go. There you so, go. yeah. But awesome, are you going to go back? Oh, I got to. I have to. Yeah. I've got to do it in the other direction, man. Yeah. Just like you. I know you, totally. you feel the same way. we got to do yeah. it in the other direction. It'll be like another decade. 
we right. do both, if, we, if it's a decade from now and we both get our second shot at doing it the other way let's just run together that'd be sweet that'd be <laughs> well i ran i ran around a lot of really good friends and i didn't get to run with a whole lot of people i ran with a lot of really cool people but there yeah. were some people where i'm like i didn't see you the whole race and you finished like 10 minutes behind me like jamil right. okay. i didn't see him the whole yeah. race he finished like, he finished like five minutes behind me what jamil we could have run the whole race together and had yeah. a lot of fun it yeah we ran for like what a half hour at the start or an hour that was it not even, not that even much. cool anyway well, good. congratulations john first Thanks, one man. is always a big one man you crushed it out there yeah I'm, I'm i'm super stoked for you and uh i hope everybody got something out of this podcast but i hope we get to do it in the other direction as well at some point totally that sounds awesome nice work to you too Coop. thanks man all right folks there you have it there you go much thanks to john for coming on the podcast today and i don't think anybody realized this but john was literally one hour removed from returning to his home in montana from the drive back from hard rock so for him to get up and do this podcast with that short of a turnaround kudos to you i think both of us were a little bit uh intellectually hamstrung with all of the sleep deprivation and the physicality that we went through over the course of the weekend congratulations john on your finish on your first hard rock finish it was a great one and i'm sure you had an excellent time out there also thank you to all the fans that were out at the hard rock 100 this weekend i cannot tell you how many times i was running around the course on every single section and somebody would say that they're a listener that they're a fan of the podcast that they're a fan of the book and i never ever ever thought i would have an experience like that where i would run around a course for over 30 hours and hear these constant words of encouragement that were emanating from you all the listeners that all take in this podcast each and every week so thank you thank you thank you i'm very humbled that this has had an impact on your lives and on your ultra running careers and your training i i'm just kind of beside myself when I get all this feedback. That is it for today, folks. If you like this podcast, please feel free. Share it with your friends, share it with your family, share it with your training partners. As always, this podcast is brought to you without sponsors, and that is so people like John and I can talk about our training in a completely unadulterated fashion. We're not going to be sponsored by pizza companies, by pancake companies, or baking companies, or anything like that. We're going to call it as we see it. That was my promise to you since the inception of this podcast, and that reigns true today. Appreciate the heck out of each and every one of the listeners, and as always, we will see you out on the trails.